Welcome to the conversation. I'm Paul Grandal, the director of the New York State Writers Institute at the University of Albany. Very excited with our guest today, Krista Paravani. She is uh, from Albany, and we'll talk about that, but she's also an acclaimed memoir writer. Her first memoir, Her, uh, which we'll talk about, and forthcoming memoir, uh, Loved and Wanted, a memoir of choice, children, and womanhood. Krista, welcome to the conversation. Thank you for having me, Paul. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, it, yeah it's, it's strange that everything is virtual now, but you actually came in person <laughs> to the Writers Institute a few years ago when, when her came out. I did. So obviously you knew your way around. Uh, you, you, you grew up in Albany and, and, mm -hmm. uh, or, or have a connection in Albany. Tell us mm -hmm. about uh, your local connection. Um, well, I was born in Albany um, at St. Peter's Hospital, and I lived in Albany until I was about five and when I was younger uh, my mother had married a marine and we moved all around the south between marine corps bases and then when I was uh, in eighth grade we moved back to the region to the capital district and um, I went to high school there. I went to Gilderland High School and my mom still lives in Albany and all of my aunts and uncles and um, my mother actually grew up in Albany um, so it's my home, really. <laughs> I just have never, I haven't lived there again since I was 18, <laughs> so. Our daughter graduated from Gilderland High School. I'm oh. at home in Gilderland, we live in Gilderland. My wife grew up in Gilderland, her five brothers and sisters and things, so. Oh, fantastic, um, I still, I, I love it. I do, I actually, I've come to really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. So you're also a faculty member, I should have mentioned, you're on the Department of English Assistant Professor at West Virginia University. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you've taught at other programs. I also mm -hmm. want to talk about, you did a, uh, you had a uh, residency at Yaddo, which mm -hmm. is a, a partner of ours up in Saratoga mm -hmm. Springs. You've been to the McDowell Colony. We'll, we'll get into that. Um, but talk about it comes up in, in, in Loved and Wanted, uh, mm -hmm. A very small house on Orlando Avenue, I believe. Is that mm -hmm. where you grew up? Um, no, uh, my mother grew up in that house on Orlando Avenue. Uh, she was one of five children. Um, my grandparents were older when she was born. My grandmother was a house cook and my grandfather was a house painter and they lived in a 950 square foot two bedroom house on Orlando Avenue. <laughs> very <laughs> Which, close to the university. I know those are all little bungalows. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's right across the street. But the the house was in my family for years and years, and so I'd I've spent actually a decent amount of time in that house. Right. Um, yeah, but I didn't grow up in that house. It was passed along in our family, and um, yeah, it's right near the university. Mm -hmm. I mean, one, I want to thank you for being a survivor. You've dealt with a lot of trauma, and you've come up the hard way. I mean, to see that you mm -hmm. are, are a professor at a major university and publishing mm -hmm. memoirs, but you, you had a very difficult time I'm, from what I gather and what I've read, you know, economics has always <clears throat> been a challenge. Uh, talk about growing up and your mom, you mm -hmm. know, uh, single parent and, and mm -hmm. limited means and, and mm -hmm. struggling economically. Yeah. I, I'm, my mother, my mother raised me by herself and she, for most of my young life, she was a waitress and she eventually, um, wound up going back to college and studying laboratory technology and started working in a hospital later. But, you know, in the years after she started college, I, you know, I was home by myself a lot. And my mother was both waitressing and trying to go to school full time and raising two daughters. And, you know, the the idea of scarcity was one that I was raised with because it was real. We were on a budget. My mother, um, worked so hard. She really did. And I, um, I grew up around that kind of ethic. And my mother had a much harder life than I did, believe it or not, in so many ways. Um, and, uh, you know, really what happened was she worked hard and we didn't have very much. And I went to Gilderland High School and I got a fabulous education there. My mother bought a house in that school district because she knew that it would offer me something that uh, was not available to her when she was younger. And I was so lucky and wound up being able to go to a good college and then a good graduate school. And now I'm a professor. <laughs> and I have this fantastic career. However, you know, like one of the things about, you know, writing Loved and Wanted was that 
I ask myself consistently, well, wh why do you make the decisions that you make? You know, because so many of the decisions I've made in my life, which I talk about in the book, uh, are not necessarily decisions that my peers, of my writer peers are making. You know, I told my friends I was moving to West Virginia to teach at WVU and it was a great job. It didn't pay very well, but it was a good job. And people said, why are you doing that? <laughs> you know, why are you moving from Los Angeles to West Virginia? And I thought, well, because I know what it means to need to be able to support oneself and this is a way to do it. And I know that it, I think it was a great decision in the long run. Um, you know, sh in the short term, there were some very hard things that I write about that happened, but um, it was a decision that was made out of the scarcity that I was raised in. And I understand that now. <laughs> yeah, so so I think a, almost a character in Loved and Wanted is poverty, like down mm -hmm. to the last less than a hundred bucks in your checkbook and two mm -hmm. young children, a, you know, a, mm -hmm. a, a toddler and a pre-toddler and a full-time job and, and not enough money to pay the bills. and like so many Americans now with the coronavirus has pushed them over that edge. They were paycheck to paycheck, but just like one little hiccup away from disaster. And you were right there. Um, mm -hmm. Talk about what that feels like, because you knew it growing up. There's always kind of, it must just be sort of a bunker mentality, like, you know, preparing for the next hit that's going to swamp us and get us evicted or, you know, millions of Americans face this. But what's it feel like as someone who's lived it? And, um, well, I mean, first, if there was ever a zombie apocalypse, you definitely want me on your team. <laughs> because when things are bad, I just, I'm good at knowing how to pull out of them. There's that <laughs> one. But, you know, uh, it was hard. And um, also, we're talking about poverty a lot more now than we were then when I was going through this. You know, there was shame. I thought, why can't I afford this on my salary and you know my husband tony um was on and off working in hollywood and we're both writers and you know it's it catches catch can in that world and i didn't i you know the, the thing that really got us was daycare and it's so expensive most of my salary was going to daycare so here i am i'm a professor at the university and everything i'm making is going to rent and daycare mostly to daycare and it was impossible. So I found out that I was pregnant for a third time um, after I had my second daughter. She was one year old. She was one year old. Uh, it was just two weeks after her first birthday that I found out I was pregnant with my son Keats. And you know, I was less worried about myself in the scarcity than I was for my children because I thought, what am I going to offer them? How am I going to do this? How am I going to educate them? You know, in West Virginia, the schools are not fantastic and um, the daycare is hard to come by. And I knew that there was not going to be the room to be able to send my children to private school, for example, and, you know, mitigate some of the um, conditions there in public schools. And a daycare was just not going to be affordable at all. And I thought, how am I going to keep my job? how am I going to work and be a mother? You know, and it's interesting now because I, you know, these were the things that I was thinking about then and everyone's dealing with it at this point. You know, it's like no one has childcare. It's too expensive to be able to, you know, send your children to a, a provider if you can find one, if they're in elementary school, for example. People don't think about having to pay for childcare outside of, you know, after kindergarten, but that's where we are as a country. And the idea of childcare being, you know, um, out of reach for so many is something that we're thinking and talking about now. And we weren't then. And I was struggling. I was struggling with it, but it didn't feel like something that I, I could necessarily articulate because it right. didn't, my friends weren't talking about it, for example. Right. So... I think this book is too is also very much a book about geography. Mm -hmm. I mean, you craft beautiful sentences, description, just lyricism, mm -hmm. but it's also a book that 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 has really important, timely topics behind it. Certainly, access to quality health care, mm -hmm. women's reproductive rights, mm -hmm. uh, women's uh, ability to control their own bodies and terminate mm -hmm. a pregnancy if they want. Uh, all this is sort of um, tinged by 
both the politics and the culture of West Virginia. Can you talk about, um, say, if you were back in Albany or in California where you had lived, I don't think you would have faced the same barriers and hurdles that you did uh, in West Virginia. No, I wouldn't have. I mean, I had in I went to Bard College, so not too far from the capital region, and um, I had an accidental pregnancy in college, and and I had an abortion. I write about it in the book. Um, the nearest place was Hudson. That was the closest place to go. Um, I wound up having an abortion in Albany because my mother lived there. But um, so when I was looking through my options uh, when I found out that I was pregnant with Keats and um, there was no, there were, there were no options. I mean, the, the only clinic in West Virginia was four hours from my house and there were all sorts of laws that existed that made it very hard for you to seek uh, proper care. Um, there's a 48 hour waiting period for reproductive health care, for example. Actually, my, it's 24. There's a 24 hour waiting period, but you have to go to the doctor three times. So basically, it's a two week period of time that you would need to have off from work if you lived where I did at that point to be able to travel to get reproductive health care. There was no one to take care of our children. There was also, you know, the thing that I was not prepared for was the idea that seeking reproductive health care was wrong. There's a way in which, you know, when you're told that there are all these hurdles between you and this health care, that you immediately internalize that and think, what is wrong with me that I'm doing this? When I felt and had always felt that women should be able to make their own decisions for, you know, for their bodies, my husband felt the same way. Um, and it's not a decision that, uh, you know, as a mother of two already, I love being a mother. I love my children. It was not a decision that I had come to lightly in terms of thinking that it was a necessity, but I really did not know how we were going to afford that child. And um, I couldn't do it. It, it. it was it was not it was not feasible. And the thing is that that's not uncommon in the United States. I did yeah. not realize that then, but it isn't. It, there are so many states that only have one has one have one provider, and a lot of places have that provider even farther away than the, what I was dealing with. And the tr the public transportation systems in states like this are sometimes often limited. So, so there is really literally no way to access that care in so many places in the United States. And I didn't know that then because I had taken it for granted that I had grown up in New York and I had lived in California. And New York and California are the two places in the country that still have reasonable access. Right. So, yeah. The book, when I, when I was reading it, um, Loved and Wanted, mm -hmm. there's a desperate tone almost like you're on the edge of a breakdown uh -huh. i don't know if it felt like that when you were living it but here you are 40 or almost 40 mm -hmm. this this third child you're you're at the brink economically um did it feel that that desperate at the time and were you close to to losing it emotionally or mentally yes <laughs> it did feel that way you know i wanted to capture that voice in this book because I, what I wanted was for the reader to understand what it means to be pushed to that brink. So writing the book, I was no longer in that, in that space. I had to, you know, I had to conjure it in a way. So I'm kind of, I'm glad that you said that. I haven't really talked to many people who have read it yet, but, um, you know, that was the tone that I was looking for because I want, I wanted people to understand just how low you can get in that situation when you feel that you don't have agency over your own own life, you know? Uh, and I really felt like I didn't. I, um, and I didn't, that's because I didn't. <laughs> and um, I, you know, the thing that was hardest for me in that time, and I didn't know what I was going to do with it, is I just kept thinking, what am I gonna tell my daughters? What am I going to tell my daughters about what it meant to live in this period of time and what it meant to struggle? Because Josephine is going to remember mom crying about not being able to pay for groceries. Josephine's going to remember her mom like this. What am I going to tell them? And then what am I going to do when they're older and we live in a country that they might be in the same position? Um, and that made me crazy because there's nothing about, you know, parenting that, you know, you, you know, uh, is there's like, you don't, 
you, you, you can't protect your children. And the reality of that being, it was the first time that I understood it in a visceral way that I was no longer necessarily going to be the protector that I wanted to be because I was not important enough, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So you brought up Tony, your husband. Mm -hmm. uh, it's no secret you've you've done events together. Uh -huh. You're both well known literary uh, uh, authors. Uh, mm -hmm. Anthony Swafford. He had a big bestseller, Jarhead. Mm -hmm. He was a marine. He was a mm -hmm. sniper in combat. Mm -hmm. As a reader, I, I sort of felt angry, and that you almost let him off the hook. I mean, mm -hmm. he's your partner. And you're at the mm -hmm. brink and he's made a lot of money at least at some point with his books mm -hmm. and yet you say he won't share any financial information with you he doesn't really help out when you're down to your last hundred dollars so first of all has has he read it or seen the book how does he feel what do you want readers to take away from this relationship with a partner who doesn't really seem to be there when you really need him i mean, i don't have that answer I wish I did. I, uh, I think a lot about the reasons why people make the decisions that they do. Um, Tony and I met and he did not, he had, he was in a financially difficult place. And this is no secret. He wrote an entire book about how he is terrible with money. <laughs> so, you know, when I, when I talked to the Henry Holt lawyer about vetting this book, he said, look, I looked up your husband. He's terrible with money. <laughs> oh, did you, let me present what would you say, what do you want readers to feel or, or think about Tony? Since you're very careful with the way you present all the scenes and the characters, you don't leave him out, but you, you, you don't really express any, I don't know, lingering anger, or resentment. You sort of take it on yourself, but I keep reading like, wait a minute, he's got a teaching job. He's made some money from his books. Mm -hmm. How come he isn't helping this family that has economic, you know, hardship. I, I don't know. I mean, it's something about him that I don't understand. And I think that um, you would have to ask him that I, I, I will, you know, and I think you can feel the anger in this book. Right. And I want to address it, but I don't. And there's a really good reason that I don't in the book. It's because I ever, every time I did sit down to write, about it, I thought this is taking away from the story that I need to tell, which right. is a story about women. And it every, and I say it in the beginning of the book, you know, I don't want to make a moment in my life when it was hard for me because I was a woman and make it about my husband. And I really do mean that. Um, but once you start doing the dance of the marriage and parsing that all out, it takes away it takes away the intensity of the other story, which is the one that I wanted to tell. I mean, there's plenty of time in my life to write that other book. Uh, I think though, um, there was a little technical issue where you froze there, but I, I'll tell you that I think, you know, Tony and I was saying, uh, Tony, we come from similar backgrounds. He, you know, he's a Marine. He, you know, he's been out of the military for a long time, but I think that there's a mindset there in the Marine Corps that is one that he's carried with him. And it, it, that's his demon, it, you know, in terms of the way he is able and not able to manage his life as a, as a man and, and, you know, financially. But you go into the Marine Corps and they take care of everything for you. I know that because I lived on a base. You don't even pay your own electric bill. They pay it for you. Um, so I think, and his father was a traumatized Vietnam vet, and he was raised in that household as well by a man who behaved exactly the way that he behaves now. A really loving father, um, a troubled father. My husband is a really loving father. He is an excellent father. In some ways, he's a much better father than I am a mother. Um, I happen to be way more organized. <laughs> you know? But I do, I think about it a lot, and I think that, you know, the birth of that, uh, that behavior comes from that root. And yeah. in that way, I'm forgiving and also frustrated, but I think that's not just the story that I have. It's an American story. And I, you know, I bet if you talk to lots of families of vets, it's not an uncommon story. Right. No, you, 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 you kind of get right up to the edge and then you pull back from that because your writing is always so honest and so um authentic and, and mm -hmm. you sort of pull back from that and you 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 sort of twist yourself linguistically to say it's not a, my husband's book it's my book it's my story yeah. you know he he's sort of inseparable from the mix but we'll we'll 
push that aside for now. Yeah, well, I want to say one more thing about that, which is this. So my father was a terribly abusive man, um, and he was not in my life. One of the hardest things about being raised in that house was knowing that that's how he behaved and feeling that I was of that. My husband is not that man, obviously. Um, but I didn't want to know that about my father because I never was able to understand that it didn't have anything to do with me. It had to do with him. And I want to protect my children from the ways that my husband frustrates me because he doesn't frustrate them that way. And they deserve to have that relationship with their father. I had not, I had not before this point encountered that as a writer. The responsibility I felt as a mother for my children really is, you know, first and foremost, even in writing. <laughs> and that was the one place I thought this will hurt them. I don't think it's, I do believe that my son will grow up in a home with a strong mother and understand why I wrote this book, but there's no taking back uh, a book that slams somebody's dad. There's just not. Um, I can explain to him what it means to be a woman in this country and need access to reasonable care and for my children to need access to reasonable care, not just, uh, you know, reproductive health care, but care. And right. Yeah. I mean, you're a brave writer that, that shares so much personal, your previous book, which, which we can talk about her. Mm -hmm. um, but you have a little recurring line that's almost a mantra in this book, mm -hmm. writers tell. Do mm -hmm. you find that it, it's, it's a sort of a cathartic thing to tell such deeply personal? Is it something you're compelled to do is it what is that thing to just put a completely bright light on on all your your most deepest darkest you know things well i think that a lot of trouble uh lives in shame and shadow in that way and i i think that you know writing that line that was just a way to like bolster myself in that moment because I thought, can I do this? Can I write this book? Can I do this? And apparently I can, <laughs> but it was something that I was telling myself and not just about, there's a taboo about writing about West Virginia, Appalachia and West Virginia specifically has seen a lot of uh, people taking advantage of them by coming into that state and taking from them and uh, exploiting them. And I didn't feel that I was doing that. And you know, it was, that was my home. I sent my children to school there. I gave birth there. Uh, I teach the young people of West Virginia. And so I, but I didn't feel that I could tell the story because I did not see, you know, in the way that, for example, it's not necessarily flattering to talk about Tony in the ways that I did. I don't, I worried about harming them. I worried about harming the state of West Virginia. In a, in a way that I, um, it made it really difficult to write this book because that was always on my shoulder. Um, and writers tell, it, telling myself that propelled me through, <laughs> it really did. It's the line that stayed that, you know, got me to remember that this is what I do. Right. So let's talk about her, this memoir about mm -hmm. your identical twin sister, Kara, mm -hmm. who suffered a horrific, uh, sexual violent assault and then who became addicted to opioids mm -hmm. and um, died uh, that way uh, and you you bring her into this book some you know you you so obviously she's still with you and always will be but what's been the lingering reaction to that book both from readers and to you as a writer and and do you feel like you got it all out in that book or it's it's something you're going to have to keep returning to. Oh, I think I got it all out and I was surprised that it came back. <laughs> I, 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 um, yeah, I was surprised by that. I'll get there in a second. Um, I, you know, that book, I needed to write that book because, and I understand now, um, what the link between these two books is, which might not be obvious 
to everyone, but to me in terms of what the compulsion was to write them. You know, I wrote her because I wanted other people to know what it was like to lose an identical twin because people often want a twin. You know, we want that intimate connection with somebody. And I thought this is the perfect way to talk about grief because it is like losing yourself in some ways. Um, but also, you know, as you mentioned, my sister was uh, an assault survivor. She was uh, brutally assaulted and raped by a man in the woods while she was walking her dog and uh, it destroyed her life and she eventually died and she died from that experience you know she medicated with drugs you know first prescription drugs and then heroin and she was highly functional really bright totally destroyed and uh, I was unable at the time I was a young woman um, I was unable to help her because I didn't understand what it meant to have somebody in my life who had been assaulted and how, how to go on with her and to help her. And I wrote that book because I wanted other families to understand addiction a little bit better in terms of what happens, you know, if somebody, you know, your sister, brother, your mother is addicted to heroin, which get, it happens, <laughs> you know, it's not, it, I feel like we were, we were, we were covering it up in this country during that time, especially, and there was so much shame in that for her too. And uh, I wanted to, I wanted to illuminate that experience for people because I thought it would be helpful. And I've gotten a reaction, um, still people read the book and they, you know, they write to me and they thank me. And I'm so I'm glad that I did that. Um, so both, you know, addiction and assault were things that I felt like I needed to tackle to help other people, the people who are still here and living. Um, so I did it. And in, you know, in this book, it's not that different in some ways. I see something that's wrong and that we need to talk about. And because I lived it and I have the skill to write these books, I should, and I hope it helps people, you know? So I guess I'm more of an activist than I thought. <laughs> I really like sentences a lot, <laughs> but you know, I, I, want, I want to help people. So let's talk about, you know, both of these books describe, you know, having face on trauma mm -hmm. and dealing with it and surviving and overcoming it. You know, we have a campus with thousands of young women. Mm -hmm. Certainly you've read about, know about the, the you know, spiraling, escalating level of depression and, and mm -hmm. uh, anxiety in young people in general, young women in particular. You know, the coronavirus pandemic has only made it worse. What have you mm -hmm. learned from, from surviving these traumas and going forward that, that could help young women? Well, one thing I tell myself is there's tomorrow. So today might feel really unsurvivable, but there's tomorrow. And I think about that if you're lucky, you know, I think about that for my sister quite a lot. Um, and I wish that she had remembered that. And I do believe that had she just gotten through those hard years and it would have been work, that she would have arrived on the other side of that difficulty with the ability to live a life that was uh, fulfilling to her and to find happiness. Um, but she didn't um, because, you know, depression is a beast and she succumbed to it. She died because she could not face her depression and anxiety and she medicated it. I think that the only way to really deal with it culturally is to talk about it and I feel like we talk, a, I mean, it, the coronavirus has really brought this out, which is good. People are talking about their mental health. We are still expecting people to do astronomically large amounts of work in an environment where we're all losing our minds, you know, and that's not okay either. I feel like we need to reckon with the ways in which our society works that cripples us and allows us to feel like there might not be a tomorrow or that, that you know, I, I just, I just, I know that talking about it is the way to do it. I also, you know, writing about it has helped me. I don't believe that writing is a cathartic experience. That's not my thing, but it must be in some capacity. <laughs> I think I like to wrestle it down and feel like I've, you know, I've looked at, I've, I've been able to like pin it every single way until I've mastered it. It's not about feeling better. It's just about winning, I think, in that way. 
I'm joking, but not really. But yeah. that also helps. I feel, you know, people finding your calling, engaging yourself in things that you love, even if that's gardening or drawing, that those are the ways to save yourself. Right. So let's talk about Keats. How did uh -huh. you choose that name? A beautiful uh, literary name and uh, a, a very unusual name. How did you choose the name for your baby? It just came to me one day while I was sitting at the dining room table and Tony was across from me and I said, how about Keats? And he said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I, I love Keats. I love, you know, I love the, Keats's poetry. Um, and I just, uh, I knew that he needed to have a name that was big. He needed a big name. This was a boy that needed a name like that. <laughs> it also turns out that he, you know, he was born and he is so soft and so sweet and he is neat and orderly and he my other my daughters are wild animals <laughs> they really are what are their ages now what are your oh um josephine is nine iris turned four yesterday and keats is two and a half mm. yeah those are all beautiful names um but Keats, you know, you go into great detail in the book and, and you go into a lot of OBGYN. I mean, you take us into the exam room, you you talk about the good doctors, the bad doctors, the, the mm -hmm. staff and nurses that aren't very helpful and that are just frankly against, um, you know, anti-abortion things. Um, but Keats had a very difficult passage. You know, he, he was face upright and they had to twist mm -hmm. him. I'm not taking a lot away from the book. I don't think mm -hmm. that's not the point, but, but tell us his, his physical issues in the birth when they had to turn him and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll, I'll, yes. I'll, let me tell you. And first, I just want to say, cause I haven't said it before that I really do believe that it is possible to be pro-choice and have wanted to have a choice for myself at this moment and still love and want my son, which is what this book is about. Keats is loved and wanted. You know, when I came to the title of this book, I thought, what am I going to tell Keats about this book? And I'm, you know, I said, I'm going to tell him that he's loved and wanted. That's what it's called. <laughs> the end, you know, that's where it comes from. Um, so, you know, I had an, I was accidentally pregnant at 40 years old and I couldn't afford a third child and I wanted an abortion because that was a sane thing to do because we could not afford him. But I had him in the state of West Virginia. And, you know, it turned out that in, you know, readers of this book will find out that it's not just about reproductive health care. It's about what happens to children in states where reproductive health care is curtailed. My son uh, suffered uh, in the state of West Virginia because it's a state that is overtaxed. The health care is overtaxed. There are good ta uh, taxed. There are good people that live and work in the state of West Virginia. I had an excellent midwife. There were kind nurses in the hospital. There were some, you know, people who were not kind, um, not in the hospital, but, you know, anti-choice people that I encountered in uh, my uh, search for uh, reproductive health care at the beginning of my pregnancy with Keats. But um, what I found was this, is states that uh, deny reproductive health care to women also cut funding to women's health care. You cannot separate women's health care from uh, prenatal care and from, you know, early child care. You can't. So those states have the highest rates of uh, death amongst children because the resources aren't there. I, you know, those are just the facts. Those were facts that when I was pregnant with Keats that I did not know. Um, it surprised me. And it was something that I arrived to in my research after I had him because what happened when Keats was born was it was a hard labor. Uh, I didn't, you know, he was born um, probably he was face up and his clavicle got stuck on the way out and he had a broken bone from that they had to pull him out uh twist him out and he had a really profoundly bad lip and tongue tie that caused him to be unable to eat food and ha he had severe jaundice and um he he was re in really bad shape and i was asked to leave the hospital anyway and there was no it was the first time in my life as a mother that I had to fight to be heard for my son because no one was taking it seriously. But I, you know, here I am a mother of two children. I had breastfed both of my daughters for many years. I was a veteran of breastfeeding. I understood that the son, my son was not eating. 
but nobody believed me, you know, and uh, no one knew that his bone was broken. <laughs> so. They basically say, take yourself and him in front of a sunny window or something. I mean, it was so yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Well, he, his, yes, he had really bad jaundice. And in any other place, they would have put a Billy Rubin blanket on that baby and kept him in the hospital. But this hospital was overcrowded. And they told me to send him home and put him in front of a window, which was like, you know, 110 degrees. And he was really, he was really failing at home. He was... It was hard. Yeah. Well, I'm glad Keats is doing well and he's sweet. great. <laughs> so what what do you like to do with your kids during this strange, you know, lockdown period and stuff? What do you do to just make life as much fun as you can for three kids young kids? Well, we got a trampoline. <laughs> there's a playhouse, a trampoline, there's reading of books, there's, you know, lots of chaos and a uh, messy home uh, that I, you know, that Keats is trying to tidy up all the time because he's I orderly and tidy. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's kind of, you know, this time has been hard, obviously, for everyone. It's been hard. And it's also been kind of beautiful to see my daughters become friends because their social circles have become no one but us. <laughs> and they play together. And I can see that the bond that they have is going to be a lasting bond. It's uh, touching. That's been the best thing that's come out of this time period. Um, but it's hard having three kids at home and working and, you know, I'm still teaching and having the children wrestling in the background. <laughs> They're not here right now. <laughs> How are you dealing with teaching remotely? Um, we're, we're, we talk about that a lot too. So you don't have to be in Morgantown anymore, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, um, but how is it just keeping students involved, engaged, uh, you know, when everybody's in different places, a lot of them never came to campus, at least some at University of Albany, they're at home, they're spread out around the state or further. How do you keep it going as a teacher? I think um, it's been it's been a challenge. One of my classes is asynchronous. I find that to be maddening. I don't like it because I you, the intimacy that you have with your students is just zero. That's hard. Um, but I can see. And um, the other one is a creative writing lit class that I teach via Zoom, like we're talking here. Um, and I'm sure that you you know I'd be curious to hear what your experiences are. But you know I I feel like people are hungry for engagement, but they don't want to be on their computers right now. So I feel for my students. I think we're all tired of being online in this way, but also that we need each other. So there's that. It's just I think. In creative writing, you have the ability to um, teach a class that is that where you you take all the walls down and you're just there. And so I try my best to create an environment where people feel present and together, even when we can't be. I do see students are struggling right now, and and I understand why, and they should be struggling. We're we're asking a lot of them. They feel pressure. They're trying to work jobs too on the side if they're lucky enough to be employed and they feel afraid for their health. Some of them are taking care of other people. And I worry about them. I do. Yeah. So writing is such a solitary mm -hmm. practice. And you have three young kids and you mentioned a dog. It's like, how do you, <laughs> how do you carve out you know, time to spend alone on the page and rework because I can tell you 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 must rework and rewrite and revise because those sentences are beautiful they're highly polished um and then you mentioned this book you thank McDowell Colony mm -hmm. Yaddo and Saratoga mm -hmm. Springs how are you able to leave to go to these writers retreats when you've got three young kids and stuff and well Tony really stepped up he did. I had a deadline for this and I book. I give that to Tony because yes. I don't know. Tony, Tony's minus <laughs> column is bigger than his plus, but I give a plus to Tony for that. He, uh, I sold this book and my publisher wanted it for the election cycle and I had four months to write it. So I wrote this book in four months. Wow. And um, I, I was really fortunate. The McDowell Colony gave me uh, an emergency fellowship and had me go for a month right after I sold it. And actually, I didn't get to go to Yaddo yet because it got canceled. I, I was supposed yes. to edit and finish the book there, but I 
because of COVID, it, it was, you know, it's postponed until the summer. Hopefully, you know, I get to go um, and I'll work on another book. It won't be this one. But um, place. oh place. yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was so, I was so pleased when I, you know, when I got in, it was just very exciting. But I um, also, after I left McDowell, I went home and I worked and I had a really reliable hub, child care provider then. Her name is Nancy. She's right. so fantastic. I we moved since then. I don't have Nancy anymore. But Nancy was like my wife. <laughs> she Nancy, if it were if Nancy didn't exist, I would not have written this book. It wouldn't have happened. Um, and I I owe everything to Nancy. Um, but uh, yeah, I then I went to France to the Dormar House in Minerve, and I was there for a month, and I worked there. And then I came home around you know right before Christmas and worked and worked and handed the book in at the end of you know January. There was no time. It was my, it was myself in the chair. My back hurt. <laughs> I don't recommend writing a book in four months at all, especially when you're me. I'm a slow writer. I'm not fast at all. You like I pay attention. It was terrifying, <laughs> but it's, I did it. It's a, it's a beautiful book. I mean, it's a tough book. It, it's, um, I guess I would want to know one, who have you shared it with? Uh, because it, 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 it's fairly critical about certain aspects of the culture of West Virginia, I would say. I would say it, it's critical of, of the healthcare system there. Um, but I also think it's, it is more about you and your story. It's, it's not a polemic, it's not a political book. But who, who has read it and what's the reaction been so far? Not very few people have read it. Tony has read it. And uh, he, he, he congratulated me and told me that I'd written a beautiful book. He was proud of me. There's uh, another one in the plus <laughs> Tell Tony, he's, he's, com he's coming into the plus column with me. <laughs> yeah, so he, he was uh, really proud and he's read the book. Um, other than that, there's really no one who read the book. Share, do you two share and edit and critique each other's work? We don't. Now? We don't do that. You know, we're very different writers. He's like he's blunt in a way that I'm not, and I'm, I'm, I'm. You know, I, I, I'm. I wouldn't say I'm withholding. I'm not. I'm just really careful about the way I consider saying something in a way that he's just fearless. And I feel like if. If I had him reading over my shoulder, he'd say, don't worry about them, <laughs> just say it. <laughs> Maybe he's right, but I just need to come to it on my own, you know? But yeah, I, ch I shared some bits with him, but I wanted this book to be mine. So I didn't share it with many people at all. No one, as a matter of fact. And um, my editor read it and my agent read it and you've read it now and just like a handful of people. So I don't know what, I don't know what the reaction will be. It's something like with her, I had lots of readers. Right. I was teaching myself how to write a book. This was really written by myself with not a lot of feedback. Thanks for sharing it with me. I think it's Keats's book too. I think uh, when Keats is a grown man, he'll look back and thank his mother for, for telling the truth, you know, and, um, who would you want to play you in the movie if you sell the movie rights? Oh, this one? <laughs> I don't know. I did sell the movie rights to the other book, to her. Oh, really? What's happening I, with it? Uh, it's in development right now with Fox Searchlight and John Killick, and, uh, who is a great producer who's made some films that I really love. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the casting has been discussed and there's somebody who's interested and stepped up to the plate, so we'll see. And they're great. <laughs> they would play I can't. I'm sorry, but it's very exciting. <laughs> um, but I can't because um, it's not been announced yet. But um, yeah, that person would play both me and Kara. But I did uh, place the rights to this book with a uh, television producer, and I'm going to write the pilot. So. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, we'll see. Once I get a minute, you know, I, I thought that I thought I would have more time, but as it turns out, teaching and. Who, who do you think? Who? Who? What actors? What do you admire that you would hope aspire to play you? I mean, I would love somebody like Michelle Williams to play that role. You know, somebody who believes in reproductive health care, who's around my age and, you know, at that time. Um, I also think that they're not enough parts for women in their 40s and early 40s, late 30s. So I think this would be a good part for lots of women who, you know, share the passion that I have for women's rights. So somebody like Michelle Williams would be really good. Yeah, but, she's, she's good. You know, I, 
I guess she's a little older now, but she, I think she looks a little bit like you as Winona Ryder. Oh yeah, bit. she would be good. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't she? Does she look a little yeah. like you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like not very tall, and yeah, she does. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. So you mentioned you're already thinking you know a next book do you already have a, a subject in mind i do i had yeah i had started writing another book um between her and this book and i because i only had four months to write this book i had to put the other book away um and i'd actually placed that book with a publisher and had to cancel that contract because uh, it was a strict contract that didn't allow me to publish this book first. So I had canceled it and now I have to re-go at it again. But it's a book about um, a woman who is, uh, who's introduced to me by a friend. Um, it's a book of nonfiction uh, about her life. She was a uh, head at um, top CIA operative in Peshawar during the Bin Laden years. And um, had come from a very religious family in Minnesota and um, had married this man in college who turned out to be pretty abusive. And she was harboring the secret of her abusive marriage while she was working at the top of the CIA, you know, doing asset conversion. It's a book about secrets right. and, you know, what it means to, I mean, she couldn't tell anybody what was happening in her home because it would have compromised national security. So she held that one with her for a long time. So this is a reported book. It's not a collaboration as told to or whatever. No, it's a reported book. When you write your memoirs, mm -hmm. it's always best if it's unfiltered from the person, but I assume she doesn't have the writing skills or something. It's going to be different you writing about someone else rather than your own life probably. Yeah, I've thought about making it into a piece of fiction so i have a little bit more liberty it's also really i mean it, i had to write a proposal for that book and have it vetted by the cia with lots of redactions and their rules and of what you can say and what you can't say although i will i will say that uh working with this woman has been one of the most profoundly touching experiences of my life because it, it's not unlike the relationship that I had with her in this way. Like I really listened to my sister's story in order to tell my story, but I used her words. And uh, her name is Christy, this woman that I was I'm writing about. And uh, you know, I will go to her house and say, "What did it? What, what did the room look like? What did it feel like at that moment to be sitting there?" <laughs> you know. So it's all about feelings. And it, and uh, I don't. You know, she's. I, I don't know if you know anything about the CIA. I didn't know, but you know, an asset conversion, it's your job to get people to tell you things and get, tell you all of their secrets. And there's a way in which, you know, the two of us are really good at that. <laughs> so together in a room, it was about openness and uh, the desire to, you know, do what I do in the other books, which is help women. And she wanted that book out there for that reason. Um, and we both understood that it needed to be unfiltered and I, needed to be allowed to not be restrained because that's not the kind of writer I am. But a great deal of trust and love has gone into that project for that reason, which is surprising to me too. So <laughs> yeah, well, good luck with that. I look forward to seeing that at some point. Good luck with, you know, the, the, the film version of her and, um, and Loved and Wanted, which is forthcoming. I don't know if you have it with you. I often, I should have mentioned, I often ask to a writer to write a, oh, I haven't seen that. I've only seen the PDF. That's beautiful. <laughs> this is just um, the- Can um, read a very brief passage to end our conversation? Sure. Should I just read the beginning? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Um, yeah, this is the galley version. The hardcover is coming for your library. <laughs> beautiful. <be> next week. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. It was the last day of my old life, the third week of October 2017, the year I turned 40. Joe was at school. Iris was at daycare. I don't remember where my husband Tony was. It's peculiar what I can't forget. Our bathroom held the sickeningly sweet smell of geranium-scented cleaner. I wore pants and not a dress, socks but no shoes a too tight blouse and unwashed hair pinned in a bun above my neck. I sat against a wall where the taupe paint was scratched, an uncapped EPT developing in my grip. I held the test upside down. 
I couldn't bear to watch. A gap beneath the door set a rectangle of yellow light across the tub. Two minutes to know what would become of me. Time passed, a whole life. I flipped the EPT over when waiting got harder than knowing. Two red lines on a white strip stared at me. A second test lay in the box. I ripped its foil package open with my teeth. Right between the sink and the commode, I crouched down, swearing in disbelief. I was still, preg I was still breastfeeding Iris, still recovering from pregnancy and birth, still lonely the way a mother is when she can't find the person she used to be. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So the book is Loved and Wanted. Mm -hmm. It's it Loved and Wanted. Forthcoming in November, the publication date is? November 10th. Mm -hmm. November 10th. Uh, Krista Paravani, uh, native of Albany, uh, acclaimed memoir writer. Thank you so much for being on the conversation. We hope when everyone's able to travel, we're able to have uh, you know in-person gatherings, maybe for your, your next book, the one you described, you can come back to the Writers' Institute. Yeah, I would love that. And, you know, maybe when I'm visiting, I can come say hello. We're, That'd be all great. Ready <laughs> yeah, we have, uh, we're on the third floor of the Science Library, and you were there a few years ago. You know where we are. So anytime you. you're in town, congratulations on this Thank book. You. Thanks for being a, a, a courageous, uh, a wonderf wonderful craft a writer, a lyrical writer, and also give our best to Tony. I will. I will. All Thank right. you so much. Thanks a lot. So long. So long.